All right, so today we're going to continue with uh, lists and list-based data structures. Uh, we're going to finish up where we uh, finish up what we were doing last time by uh, using a comparator in our uh, linked list implementation. Remember that we are on Piazza, so if you have any questions, please post there. Uh, just checking a mic. Yep, good. So uh, we left it off last time with uh, uh, by by putting a comparator into this class. Uh, so that we can have this index of method. Uh, this index of method is pretty simple. All it does is, first of all, if the comparator is not no, uh, is null, then they didn't provide a comparator when you instantiated the list, and so we throw it back at them as an illegal state uh, or illegal call or something like that. Uh, otherwise, we go through the, uh, the the list one at a time, index based. So for the index running from zero up to this dot size i plus plus. We ask the comparator, uh, the key that you're looking for, uh, and then we get the element at the ith index. Uh, and uh, if it's zero, right, remember a comparator is something negative, something positive, or zero, depending on the relative ordering of these things. Uh, if we get a hit here and it's zero because they're equal, then uh, we return the index at which we found it. Otherwise, we return negative one. Now over here in the demonstration, uh, it's not going to work yet because, of course, I didn't call the right constructor. Uh, that's where we left it off last time. So let me go ahead and create a comparator for integers here. All right? Comparator for integers, all right? and I'll just call it CMP, equals new comparator. And then this is an anonymous inline declaration. Uh, we could create this into, and put this into another class. Uh, but uh, it only has one purpose. Its only purpose is to, uh, g uh, to basically give you the functionality, just a second here, of uh, this method, compare, that takes one integer and another integer and returns something negative, positive, or zero. Okay? So there's no, no reason to put this into its own class because we would only ever have cause to create one instance of that class, and so why not just go ahead and create it and define it right here in one line? It's an anonymous, uh, inner, uh, 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 you know, ad hoc kind of declaration. So we need to, uh, you know, uh, implement the logic here. Fortunately, uh, integers are already naturally comparable. Uh, and that is like uh, the, in, in non-decreasing order. So five comes first, then ten, uh, and so all we need to do is call the compare to method on the integer class. Compare O1 to O2 and return that value. Once we have that, then what we can do, uh, I'm gonna have to move it up here uh, because I need it when I call this constructor for my linked list, all right? Now, for demonstration purposes, what I've done is I've filled this up with a million integers, just one through one million uh, by increments of one. I've always added to the start, so it is going to be um, you know, uh, decreasing so uh, in other words, it's going to be one million at the front and one way at the end. So what happens when we search for one million? One thousand, there we go, right? That should be at the last index, right? Or at the first index, at index one because it's reversed, right? I'm not going to print it out because, of course, you know, uh, I, I do print it out right here, but that's because it's empty. I'm not going to print it out here because then that would print out a million things and we'd be here a while, all right? So the index of 1, 000, 1 million is zero. Remember, it's 1 million, 999,000, uh, dot, 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 all the way down to one. It's in reversed order. Uh, so this makes sense. The index of uh, that 1 millionth element is zero. Uh, what about, say, 999,500? Right? That's about 500, right? So it's predictable. Uh, and so I have, I have high expectations or high confidence that this actually works. Uh, but let's go ahead and test that one last edge case there. One. All the way at the end. What should we get? Well, a million minus one, so 999,000, something like that. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, yeah, some, something like that. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead and do it. So this program is correct. I'm going to tell you that right now. It w if, if we wait long enough, this will work. Right. Why is it taking so long here? Let's look at that index of again. Right. And let's think about what's happening here when 
we're searching for the element one all the way at the end and there are a million elements in front of it or 999,999 elements in front of it. Uh, so what we're doing is we're starting at this end and then we're getting that, uh, we're, we're getting that element at that index and then we're comparing it. So when we, when we searched for the very first element, right, we immediately got it and immediately stopped and said, oh, okay, the, we're done, right, because we found that element one million, uh, right? Uh, even 500 away, what were we doing? Uh, when we got to 500, we started at the beginning. Remember, get element and index. All that's doing is starting at, uh, oops, uh, get node at index. So let's go to that. Uh, what that's doing is that's starting way at the beginning, like the dumb painter or the smart painter because he's getting paid more, right? Uh, the smart painter is starting all the way at the beginning, going all the way to the 500th element, and then returning that. So when, it start, when it's, you start at the very beginning of the fence, that's really, really fast, right? Because you're, you're going back and forth a, you know, a short distance. But when you've got a 1 million elements, right, then what happens? You have to start at the beginning, traverse 1 million times to get to the element that you're looking for. And by the way, to even get up to that point, you have traversed this back and forth 1 million times. Right? So think about what that's doing. 1 million times 1 million, that's how many operations there are. Right? Uh, is that at all a sensible way of doing this? Well, not if you want it to uh, execute within a few seconds, right? Uh, I'm not sure how long this would take. Uh, we could time it, you know, empirically time it. How long does it take 500? How long does it take 1,000? It's going to be growing quadratically. So if I double the input size, that's going to roughly mean 100 times as slow. Or sorry, four times as slow. Uh, so we'll go ahead and stop this now. And what's a better solution here to this index of method? Should we be using this get element at index i? Not if we want to be the, uh, not if we don't, if we don't want to be that dumb painter going back and forth, right? Then we shouldn't do that. We should take our paint bucket with us. Start at the first element. Is that it? Nope. Go to the next element. Don't start way at the beginning. Go to the second element. And is that it? Third element, fourth element. By the millionth element, you don't go all the way back to the beginning because you brought your paint can with you. You just get that element. All right. So I will go over each size, but what I'll do is I will keep track of the current node. This dot head. Right. And since I do have size, uh, I can go ahead and uh, still use that and go all the way to the end if I need to. Uh, but what I'll be doing is instead of getting the element at the ith index starting all the way back at the beginning, I will simply keep track of the current element. Now, if the current element, uh, current, that's a node, sorry, so dot get element, right? Now, if, uh, if, if, you know, if that's the thing I'm looking for, I immediately stop and just get out of this loop entirely and return the index at which I found it. Otherwise, I need to set myself up for the next, while, uh, next uh, iteration of this loop. Current is equal to current dot get next. If you wanted to, you could go back and do that inside this for, uh, for loop instead. While the current is not null, go to the next one, just like we did up here in the two string method. Right. Now let's go back to the demonstration here. Let's make sure that we didn't break anything. Right. This is, uh, this is regression testing, right? But I'm doing it in an ad hoc way. One million we know worked, that's at index zero, right? Hey, and it's also still fast. Uh, 999,500. That should be at index 500, just like before. And it's still fast, right? But now if I search for one, that should be all the way at the end. It might be a little bit noticeable, but it, here it's not, right? So lightning quick. Something that took hours, probably maybe even days to compute, I've now optimized so that it takes virtually no time at all. Now, understanding why this is requires algorithms, algorithm analysis, and it separates computer scientists from simple programmers. Right? Being able to understand why is it taking so long? Well, because you used a linked list and you use an index-based uh, uh, find method. Don't do that, right? 
And then, you know, somebody who hasn't taken data structures or algorithms and just a programmer, oh, what the hell are you talking about, right? That's what separates the, the computer scientists and the programmers, okay? Any questions on this so far? No? All right, then let's start talking about uh, other variations on this. Uh, so one variation is that you can have a doubly linked list, right? Where you keep track of the next and the previous or prev. We sometimes shorten it to just prev because then they're fo both four letter words and everything li nicely lines up, right? Uh, but a previous, uh, at least we should spell it correctly. All right, there we go. Uh, and so that why? Because then you can go back and forth, right? Uh, sometimes you can also keep track of the tail for easy access to the end of the list, right? Uh, you can have a circularly linked list, circularly linked lists, where with a linked list, I start at one end, it has a head and it has a tail, and that's the end, right? If I go past the tail, I'm out, I, I fall off the edge of the earth, and if I go before the head, then I fall off the edge, right, that way. Uh, instead, what you can do is you can take those two endpoints, bring them around into a circle. Now you've got a circular linked list. There is no head. There is no tail. Uh, instead, it, it, uh, the, the, uh, you just keep going around constantly, right? Uh, and that kind of variation is, has a lot of applications for, say, uh, you know, and, and any uh, round robin kind of uh, kind of a data structure where you've got um, I don't know uh, servers or something like that, and you just need to keep track of them, and everybody gets their turn, right? You start at this one, then you go to the next, then you go to the next, and it's a constant loop because you're always checking the servers or something like that, and you could just go back to the beginning, right? And you, there you don't have to keep track of am I at the end? Well, because there is no end, you just keep going around and around and around. Uh, you have unrolled linked lists, right? Unrolled linked lists are where you can, uh, each node uh, may contain an array of elements instead of just one. And then you link these arrays together, right? Uh, and that gives you like kind of a, a hybrid of a linked list and an array based list. Uh, say that each node holds 100 elements, up to 100, uh, capacity for 100 elements. Here's 100, and now I can link that into another array uh, node uh, that holds 100 elements. Link that into another array that holds another 100 elements. And it, it gives you kind of a hybrid between the two where sometimes you have, within a node itself, you have random access. So you can immediately jump to the end or you can immediately jump to an element. Um, uh, it, 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 it's basically a ha in between. If you, if, if it doesn't have the best of both worlds, you can tune it. Uh, you can make the, uh, the, the arrays inside of the nodes bigger or smaller. The smallest, of course, you can get gives you a regular old linked list. The biggest you can get, put everything into one node, that gives you an array list. So it's kind of you know, a tunable thing that's halfway between these two options. Uh, finally, you have a skip list, right? A linked list but with some random access because you don't just keep track of the next, you keep track of several nexts, all right? It's, uh, it's still uh, one big line, but sometimes you can skip over things. So I'll keep it uh, in, in the simple example. I'll go ahead and say that I keep uh, uh, a reference to the next element, but then I also I could skip, there, say that there are 100 elements in there. I keep a reference to the 50th element. So I can skip basically to the middle of the list. A skip list, of course, means that you have to maintain a lot more pointers or a lot more references. Uh, it also means that eventually it's not gonna be, look very nice, right? As you add stuff in, take stuff out, and every so often that skip list will need to be reorganized. Uh, but again, it's all, also a hybrid between the two because it does allow some random access. We like random access because if you want the ith element, right, and the ith element is right in the middle, with a linked list, you have to start at the beginning, go all the way to the middle. With a skip list or with an array-based list, you can jump right into the middle, right? And so skip lists offer uh, somewhere in between there, but of course they're far more complicated to implement uh, and, uh, uh, and you pay a price for that because every so often you have to restructure the list and that's gonna, that takes a lot of effort. Or, or a lot of resources, I should say, okay? 
Uh, other variations include what we're going to be starting to talk about today, stacks and queues. So we'll start out with a stack here first. And you're probably familiar with stacks uh, because of a call stack. When a function A calls a function B, how does it know where to return to? Well, function A calls function B, calls function C, calls function D. What we do is we keep track of a stack. It's like a stack of dishes, right? Uh, and when you put a, a dish on the top and you can put another dish on the top, put another dish on the top, each one of these is a stack frame. Function A has its local variables, parameters, et cetera. When it calls function B, a new stack frame is placed on the top. Function C, new stack frame, new stack frame, new stack frame. When a function is done executing, that stack frame gets popped off the top, just like the dish. You can't take it off the middle or the bottom or anything. You just take it off the top. And uh, now whatever stack frame is on there, that's, that's the calling function. You're back where you began. In other words, it's a way to keep track of breadcrumbs. Uh, breadcrumbs being, you know, from Hansel and Gretel, right? How do you get back to where you were? You drop a breadcrumb behind you so that you can look behind you and then you f see all the breadcrumbs of the path that you took so that you can reverse your path. You called A, B, C, D. Well, how do you reverse that? D, C, B, A, right? And that's, a, uh, that, that's one application of a stack. But it's got a lot more applications than just call stacks. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, stacks are a restricted, ac restricted access data structure. There we go. And what do I mean by that? So think about the collections that we've looked at so far, like lists and sets. Uh, these are uh, a bit unstructured, right? Now, we're, we're getting into data structures and algorithms. Why do we call them data structures? because we like structure. The more structure that we have, the more structure we can exploit. Uh, if it's highly, highly structured then, uh, and restricted in some way, then that means that we can do efficient operations on it, right? Uh, they're unstructured in that they just hold stuff. They just, sorry, can't type today, hold stuff, right? Lists may are ordered, right? That is the difference between a list and a set, right? that a list is ordered. In other words, there's a first element, there's a second element, there's a last element. Uh, sets uh, don't have a first element. They just have, that's a bag of stuff. It's unordered. But lists are ordered, but not sorted. There is a difference between ordering and sorting. Uh, five, three, seven, two. Two is the last element, but that's certainly not in order. That's certainly not sorted, right? Uh, whatever I said was the first five is the, is the first element, right? There is order, but there's not sorting, or there's not, uh, it's not sort in a sorted order. Uh, sorting a list imposes an order on a collection, collections state, right? But what we mean by restricted access data structures, uh, restricted access data structures, impose an ordering on uh, a collection's behavior. So this goes back to object-oriented programming, where objects, what are they? They have state, behavior, and identity. State means, you know, it, it's or, that if I sort something, if I sort a list, then that means that its current state is ordered. Of course, that doesn't prevent me from going in and inserting stuff willy-nilly, you know, uh, screwing up the order. Uh, but that's on its state. Its behavior is something else entirely. If we restrict access to this data structure through its behavior, that gives us more structure, right? A different, uh, more structure, different structure, right? Uh, so let me highlight that, its behavior. And what we mean by behavior in this case is interface. Uh, we really like we really like structure because it can be exploited for more efficient operations. This end, there we go. So how do stacks work? A stack, a stack, sorry, is a LIFO, LIFO, last in, first out data structure. Uh, it's like the stack of dishes that you can put stuff on top. You can take a dish off the top, uh, but you can't 
insert, uh, if there are 10 dishes here, I mean, you could really, if you really wanted to, shove that dish into the, uh, into the fifth one, but what are you risking? The stack falling over and breaking. Uh, you could pull out a dish from the bottom of the stack, but again, what are you risking? Everything falling over and breaking. Uh, that we only allow access to one end. We put stuff in the top and we take stuff out of the top, right? Uh, we, uh, you, uh, we, uh, we only allow access to one end of the stack. And we usually refer this to, to this as the top, of, uh, the top of the stack, right? Over here, I have that same visualization that we were working with before. And the way that it visualizes a stack is as a linked list. It doesn't necessarily have to be a linked list, uh, but let's go ahead and look at it. This is the top. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that they kept the names head and tail here, uh, but so be it. This is the top of the stack and this is the bottom of the stack. Uh, if I, uh, there are two basic operations here. I can put stuff on the top of the stack. In other words, I can push them. I can push 42 and it goes at the top, right? Uh, you can visualize it as you're adding something on the top and it's getting taller and taller and taller. Otherwise, you, uh, if you think about the dishes again, in the cafeterias, they don't have really tall uh, stacks of dishes uh, because for short, short people, that, that would be difficult to reach off the top. And of course, it's also dangerous. So how do those dishes actually work? Well, first of all, they're plastic now, right? Uh, so that they, yeah, go ahead, and, go ahead and drop all those that you want because they can't break. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what, what does a stack of dishes actually look like in a cafeteria? You take the stack and you put it and it pushes it down. It's got like some spring mechanism. And so that's what the visualization here is showing you. The other operation is a pop operation where you take it and pop it off the top. And if you keep doing that pop, 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 right? Then, it, uh, then the spring loaded action pushes the next di dish up so that it's now at the top. What happens, do you think, when we pop too much? Pop, 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 sorry, and finally pop. What would you call this stack? Empty, it's an empty stack. What if I were to try to pop off the top again? If empty, oh, there's one option. Do nothing, All right? You were expecting something back, so what might I give you then? No, right? Uh, that would be a, a perfect, uh, especially in the context of Java, that would be a perfect answer. Uh, what's another option that we could uh, implement a stack with? You asked for something that doesn't exist, so I'll throw it back at you with an exception, right? You can't pop, it is illegal to pop off an empty stack. If the stack had some capacity, right? Say if we did it with an array-based uh, uh, data structure and uh, at most 100 elements will be allowed in this stack and you tried to push onto a full stack, right? Uh, what, ha what happens in programming when you do that? What happens when you call function, 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 function and your call stack is now at capacity because you don't have an infinite call stack usually. Call one more function one more dish on the top of the huge giant stack. What happens? I don't know. What happens when you fill up a cup with too much water? It overflows. So if, it, if you do that to a stack, it'll be stack, stack overflow. Exactly, right? Uh, and the, 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 you know, in, a, in, in programming, then the, the operating system detects that and says, uh, nope, screw this, it's segmentation fault. Uh, or you know, some sort of a trap or something like that, all right? So a stack is a LIFO data structure. Uh, we only have two operations, you only have two basic operations. One of those is push, right? Add something to the top of the stack, all right? And pop. Uh, retrieve and remove the element at the top of the stack. Right? There also was another operation here, an optional operation, uh, and it's called peak. What do you think peak does? Let me create a new random stack here. Peak, 
if I told you no peaking, then you couldn't look at it, right? Peaking means that you can look at it, but not remove it, right? So what's at the top of the stack? If I were to remove it, what would I get back? And we call that optional because you could do, uh, you could achieve that by simply uh, popping it off the top of the stack. Okay, now I see what it is. I'll put it back on where, where I got it, right? So push or a pop push operation basically gives you a peak operation. And that's why we call it optional. Uh, there are other optional things that you can do, right? Uh, optional is a peak operation. That is return, but do not remove the element at the top, right? And the orientation here is just simply because what we call it a stack for a reason uh, that has, uh, I think that the actual person that came up with the, uh, the data structure name took the inspiration directly from a cafeteria stack of dishes. And that's why I use that metaphor because that's where they got it, right? Uh, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to find a citation on that, but uh, you can, another option would be what happens when you pop from a, an empty stack, right? Another option, a design option, the design decision that you may have to make. Uh, to make. Uh, do you impose a capacity, right? Another design option or decision that you have to make. How do you implement a stack, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to our Java demonstration here and I will create a new class and I'll call it a stack because it's my stack. And again, starting, at the, starting very fr from the beginning, we're gonna parameterize it. This parameterization is so that you can have a stack of strings, you can have a stack of integers, you can have a stack of whatever the hell you want, right? So there are gonna be two basic operations here, right? Put, uh, public void, or yeah, void push, an element, item or element or item, whatever, and public void pop. Sorry, that shouldn't be a void element. Why? I'm, you pop it off the top, here you go. So it should return an element of type T. Of course, we need to handle that now. Help me out. How can we implement a stack? This picture over here implements it how? It's a linked list, just turn your head sideways, right? Turn your head sideways and what do you see? It's a linked list. Where the pop operation is, does what? Removes the element at the head. The push operation does what? Inserts the element at the head. Head, tail, doesn't matter as long as you're consistent about it, as long as you only work on one end, right? Uh, and the visualization of, you know, turning your head or whatever, just turn your computer upside down if you really want, <laughs> you know, uh, if you, if you want to think of it that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our linked list implementation and I'm going to wrap it up into our stack class here. So private my linked list right, uh, of elements of type T uh, underlying list is equal to new my link list there. Now in terms of the underlying list, a push operation is what? Dot add x to where? Add element to start, okay. Uh, why did you choose start instead of end? You're put, placing it at the new head, which is good because we never implemented uh, optional. We, we, we could have taken uh, cap track of the tail and done it at the tail as long as we're keep, uh, you know, uh, being consistent about it, but we never ended up doing that. If you're always working at the tail with our linked list, what does that look like? You start at the head, go all the way to the end just so that you can do an operation. That's not gonna be efficient at all. Just like the old painter's paradox or bad painter, whatever you wanna call them. Right there. I swear that that painter metaphor, I got that from somewhere, but uh, years of research, I've never been able to find the, the original source for it. So if any, uh, uh, so I can't claim it my, as myself, my, as my own, 
But if I go another 10 years without finding it, I am going to start just claiming that it was mine. Because after 10, 15 years of, of using that, that metaphor, then you own it if you can't find the original. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, actually, in, uh, when you write academic papers, you call it folklore. <laughs> we don't know where, who came up with it first. I heard it from Joe. I heard it from Bill, right? I heard it from Jane, right? Uh, you never know where these things come from because nobody ever wrote it down. <laughs> the first person that writes it down and publishes it, then that's the person that gets the credit. All right, what does a pop operation look like? This dot underlying list dot. Did we ever do a remove? Uh oh. No, we didn't. So, do we want to go back and look what and see what that looks like? At least remove from head. Add to end. Add to start. Remove from start. Let's say. Remove. Remove from start. All right, what would that look like? What does it look like over here? Pop. I take 42, I put it into a temporary variable so I can return it. So let's do that part first. Uh, this dot head dot get element. And I will put that into a temporary, and I'm not taking an element anymore, so let me go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, TX is equal to this. And ultimately, I'm going to return x, change the return type there, get rid of all that. All right. And then what? So let me go ahead and uh, rewind this. There we go. And go step by step. Uh, t temporary is equal to the head. Head is equal to next. All right. So this dot head is equal to this dot Oh, uh, well, you can't do that. Dot get next. Now, what if there's only one element in there? What is the next? Null. So head ends up being null, giving you an empty list. Uh, what happens to that old node? I've already gotten the element out of it, or copy of it at least. That old node is now available for garbage collection. If you were in a programming language that did not support automated garbage collection, you'd still have to take care of that. If you were in C doing a linked list, that node needs to be cleaned up with a free operation. Okay. There, good. And return X. Let's go back over here to our stack. Underlying list dot remove element from the start. And return. From will start. Oh, you know what? I missed, did I misspell it over there? <laughs> Fine. There, excellent. Except what? What were those de design considerations that I asked? What about a peak operation? What happens when you pop from an empty stack? Let's find out. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this stuff. And I'm going to create a new stack, stack for integers. S is equal to new stack. Right. S dot push, we'll go ahead and push 10. We'll go ahead and push 20, 30. And then I'll go ahead and print those. System.out.println uh, s.pop. Pop, pop, pop. This should be printing what? 30, 20, 10, the reverse order, right? Just like uh, Hansel and Gretel leaving their breadcrumbs, right? They go to Position 10, then 20, then 30. How did they get back home? 30, 20, 10. All right. But what happens if I pop one more time? Let's predict. Right. So it simply calls remove from start. If the list is empty, then the head will be null. Can I call get element on a null object? Nope. So you would expect a null pointer exception. Right, and that's what you get, null pointer exception. Cancel that. Right. Okay, leave it as it is, or is there a cleaner way of handling this? What if I had convenience methods like is empty, public boolean is empty. 
And how do I know if it's empty? If the underlying list is empty. Then what could I do up here? If this dot is empty, I could throw that as a more sensible exception. Instead of a null pointer exception, what's null? I don't, nothing I have access here to head. I have no head, right? I have, uh, I have a, a linked list or I have a stack. I don't even know about the underlying linked list. The linked list has a head, right? So I have no idea what's going on here when I get a null pointer exception from the perspective of the stack. So let's make this a little bit more uh, germane, uh, relevant to the stack class. I will throw a new illegal uh, state exception and telling them you, uh, stack is empty. Do with it, uh, you know, do, uh, do your own due diligence here and, uh, oh, sorry, pop. Uh, Oh, you know what? What did we forget to do? If we remove something, what should we do? This dot size minus minus. There we go. There, stack is empty. Right. That's much much better. That's a much better error statement coming out of a stack because now, oh, okay, I can't pop from a, an empty stack. What's an alternative? If it's empty, I can return what? Oops, no. So I can either throw an exception back at them and let them deal with it, or I can return null. What are the positives, negatives of this? It, it, uh, say that again. It doesn't stop the program, definitely. But now what? Now I have some extra responsibility too, right? Are you allowed to push nulls? Uh, the, the way that we've designed it, you are, right? I can I can push a null. Right? There's no problem there. And now I'm not going to get a null pointer exception. I'm just going to end up printing null as the first element. So if I'm going to do this, I need to give you a little bit more way, uh, functionality in order to disambiguate the situation. Did I get null back because it was empty? Or did I get null back because that's what I had pushed at some point, right? Or you could redesign it so that when somebody tries to push a null element, if item equals null, not, don't allow it, right? By throwing an exception. Right? Uh, what else might we want? So what about a peak operation? Public peak return this dot underlying list dot get element where zero All right what about what happens when you pop off an empty stack we took that can we impose a capacity we could right how would we do that We'd have to create a variable private uh, int capacity, max capacity. I don't know, 100 or take that in as part of the uh, constructor. And then on our push operation, if it's at capacity, else if, uh, what is it? This dot underlying set list dot size is equal to the max capacity deal with it, throw it back as an exception, uh, do nothing, refuse to put it on top of the stack, right? Whatever you're gonna do with it. Right? So lots of things that we could do here. Uh, but did I end up using inheritance? In other words, is a stack a linked list? Is a linked list a stack? Did I extend my linked list? No, why? What if I had done that? It's perfectly fine. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to compile. What if I had done that, though? I would have inherited all of those methods. S dot remove from, uh, like, dot get element at index 5 or somewhere in the middle. Does that sound like a stack to you? 
No, what are you doing? You, if I, this was remove element at index zero, I've got a stack of dishes. Now I'm allowing somebody to take one out from the middle. Hmm? That defeats the purpose of a, of a restricted access data structure. So let's not do that. What did I use here instead? So a stack is not a linked list. A linked list is not a stack. What did I use here instead? What is it called when one object owns an instance of another object? Composition. This goes back to object-oriented programming. Prefer composition over inheritance so that you're not locking these things into a rigid hierarchy. I mean, conceptually, a stack is not a linked list and a linked list is not a stack. But it's very nice if we can use one to implement the other. So we'll prefer comp uh, 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 composition here instead. OK? Uh, what about, remember that we had our my, uh, my list over here. It was an array-based list. Could we do the same thing here? My underlying list. I'll go ahead and change this to my list instead. Uh, I'll go ahead and copy and paste this. What would it look like if it were a, a, an array-based list instead? Get size is the same, right? Add to start is the same. We never did empty, so dot get size is equal to zero. But that's just a that, that's just because we never did it like uh, we never did an is empty method. Remove from start we never did that either. But the other elements get element at index. Uh, add element to start. Do we end up having to change much? No. But what's the issue now? Ten elements. And if you're working at this side, what are you going to end up doing? Shifting everything down to push something at the beginning. Shift everything down to put something at the beginning. Oh, popping, removing. We never did it. We, we never implemented the, the remove from start. But what are you going to have to do? Take this, save it off, shift everything down, shift everything down. Everything. If there are a million elements, there are going to be a million operations to that push and, start, uh, and pop. If you work at this end. What about this end, though? If you add something to the end of your array base list, do you have to go shifting anything? Nope. So efficient. Uh, what if you remove something at the end of your list? That's also efficient. So as long as you take care to understand what's efficient and what's inefficient, shifting stuff around inefficient, right? Just adding something to the end. And so you, that's the top of your, queue, of your uh, stack. Right? Uh, and it, it could be just as efficient as a linked list. And not only that, but if you do it with an array-based list and you're going to have a capacity, create that array up front, say 100, right, max capacity. I would argue that it's even easier to do it with a max capacity because now you're not creating nodes, deleting nodes, restructuring nodes all over the place. You're just creating one array of a fixed size that you can add stuff to and, and take stuff away on one end. Right? So lots of different ways that you can do this. Let me go ahead and restore this and say that this is alternative. Just be careful. There we go. All right, that's stacks. Their sister is a queue, all right? So a stack is a stack of dishes. A queue is a what? British speak now. A line, right? A Q is a line, right? It's a FIFO data structure. First in, first out. Imagine if we lined up, I don't know, to the bank or to, uh, to the deli or something like that, and it was a LIFO data structure. The last person to walk into the door is the first one that gets served. It doesn't work like that, right? The first person to walk into the door is the first person that gets served. Everybody lines up, against, uh, lines up behind them. And so if you got there second, then you're second served, third, third served, et cetera. We work on a line. People come in and go to the end of the line, and then we serve the next person at the head of the line. Or in terms of 
a linked list again, we put, uh, I'm not sure how they do it here. Let's go ahead and NQ something, uh, 42. They go to the head of the line. <laughs> I really don't like this. And let's DQ something, let's take something out. It takes it out at that end, right? So if you want to think of it that way, here's the head of the line and here's the end of the line. I get, well, I guess that makes sense, right? Head of the line, tail of the line, right? It's just that it, I like reading left to right, so I, I don't like that they're coming in this way. And uh, Anyway, uh, but that's the, that's the basic idea. It's a first in, first out data structure, right? It has two basic operations. And some, uh, the, the terminology here, the nomenclature is going to vary from, uh, from language to language. But I like, I really, uh, the, the one thing I do like about this visualization is that they uh, call it properly. It's an NQ and DQ, right? So NQ and DQ. Some uh, implementations will, will retain the names push and pop. I think that that's terrible because you shouldn't use the same terminology for fundamentally different operations on a different data structure. Uh, some of them will call them uh, offer, uh, put it into the line, and pull, get out of the line. And the, the nomenclature there comes from the idea of an actual physical line, right? When you don't actually physically line up in a, a busy deli, instead you take a number, right? And so the now serving number 25, now serving number 26, now serving number 27, right? That's pulling. Did, did, are you still here, right? Or did it take, to, uh, take us too long to serve you and you've left, right? So you're pulling somebody for the, uh, for the next available customer. Uh, you're offering them a ticket, I guess, uh, in order to get into the line. But NQ is going to be insert something uh, to the end of the line, right? Or the tail. And DQ is uh, retrieve and remove the element at the head of the line. Right? So that's why it's first in, first out. And it, it, it's uh, at least they, they use the horizontal uh, uh, visualization here because it's kind of like a line, right? People don't, you don't stack people. <laughs> uh, they, get in, they get into a line. So really quickly here, what would it look like? New class Q. Let's parameterize it. There we go. I'm going to steal some code over here from the stack. I'm going to do this with a linked list. And now what does public uh, void NQ look like? And what does public T DQ look like. NQ takes an element X item. So we just have to be consistent, head or tail. Right? The head of the line, we'll go ahead and we'll NQ at the end of the line. We will DQ at the tail of the line. So this dot underlying list dot add uh, will add to end. Right? There we go. And this dot underlying underlying list dot add to start or sorry not add to but remove from start simply because I didn't have the remove uh, element or remove uh, the remove from end method implemented and I return this sorry same basic design considerations from before. What happens when we DQ from uh, an empty line? What happens when we want to impose a capacity? Uh, what happens, what happens, what happens? What happens when we do an array-based list? And by the way, this, this implementation is not optimized because in order to work from both ends, what would I need to do in my linked list? I would need to keep track of the tail, exactly. So this is no longer optional if I want it to be efficient. Otherwise, painter is leaving his paint, uh, paint bucket at one end. Q, though, if I, wh what about an array-based list? Here's an array. Put something in here means that I'm shifting stuff down. Taking something off, right, that means I don't have to shift everything back down. Uh, I, eventually, I have to make room for it, but not if I'm going to make a capacity. Uh, but 
I do have to shift stuff down if I do it naively. If you want to, you can create a different kind of array base list where if you've got, uh, say that you create an array of 1,000, of, of uh, 100 elements, or 100 capacity. Just keep track of the end and the beginning. Right? And adding stuff means that this pointer gets incremented. Now I've got, say, 50 elements in there at a capacity of 100. If I start taking stuff away from another end, don't, uh, don't shift stuff down, just move this reference. And now if I remove 25 elements, now I've got 25 contiguous elements stored. I don't care about those, I don't care about those. Right? Keep removing stuff and moving this forward. Don't let them pass because that's a negatively sized array and you can't have that. But this is now again an empty array. You start adding more stuff, adding more stuff, adding more stuff until you reach the end. What can you do? Just bring that pointer around back to the other end. Remove, 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 remove. Bring that pointer back out. These aren't pointers, they're just indices. Uh, but bring it around to the other end. Right? What happens when they meet like this? Like uh, This is the beginning and now they've met like this. When they meet like this, then that means it's empty. When they meet like this, that means it's full. Right? So you can do it with a, an array base list efficiently. You just have a lot more stuff to think about. Right? And just keep track of the beginning and the end index. Okay. All right. Questions about queues? No? Oh, okay. Uh, so let's talk about variations and in practice. Variations and in practice. So one variation is you could allow arbitrary removal, removal, uh, insert, retrieval, right? If you really wanted to, uh, you could allow line jumpers, right? So uh, I've never been to Disney World, but uh, they have line jumpers at Disney World. You know what they're called? Like, I think you can buy like a special pass. A what? Fast pass, Fast pass right? And they get to jump to the head of the line or there's another special smaller line because you paid several hundred dollars more or something like that. Uh, and so they've got priority people. They're very important people, or very important people go to the head of the line, right? You've got line jumpers. Uh, that's called a, or a priority queue. And wh you can assign to each element a certain priority. Uh, whoever has the highest priority gets could, to go to the front of the list. You could have you, you may uh, may not even have you know top priority. You could have priorities ranging from one to twenty. And so if you've got a priority of ten, then that means that you start at this end and you say, okay, uh, I'm higher priority than you. Higher, 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 higher. Okay, I'm lower priority than you, so I get inserted in somewhere in the the middle of the the line, right? Uh, if you have the highest priority, of course, you get to jump to the head of the line. If you have the lowest priority, you get stuck back at the big uh, end of the line. If you have an equal priority with somebody, then you can break ties arbitrarily and say, oh, they don't get to, uh, if I have priority five, I don't get to jump ahead of the other people with priority five. What's another uh, application of a priority queue? Like I said, if you have one through 20, right? 20s are all over here, ones are all over here. Would I ever have it that a two comes ahead of a five? No. So what is this thing? It's sorted, right? It is a sorted list, right? So a priority queue provides a, a, a way of sorting things and maintaining a sort. Uh, you could also have a deck. And again, this is pronounced deck, right? It allows both insert and remove operations from both ends. Right. This is also known as a double-ended double, double ended queue. Right. I don't know if that's where the deck name come, came from, but uh, like double-ended queue, uh, DQ, right? Uh, that's where it comes from maybe, I don't know. Uh, but basically it allows you to implement a stack by ignoring one end 
right? It allows you to uh, implement a queue, ignoring one operation at both ends, right? etc. You can also have variations where you use, say, three of the four operations. And one application here is undo features. So you, you, you're probably familiar with this, with like Word or something like that, where you type, 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 and then you accidentally delete a, 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 a word. Oh, I need to undo that. What do you do? Control Z is the, the, is the quick, you know, quick key for it. How does it remember what you did? It needs breadcrumbs. I did operation A, B, C, D, so that if I undo, I undo B first, then undo again, undo C. I do it in the, uh, the reverse order that I did them in. So there's a, sta uh, there's a uh, stack, right? The newest operation gets added to this end. Undo also works on this end. But you also can't you know, keep every single operation in per perpetuity, right? A million operations, that, that gets, you know, you're never gonna, re you're never gonna reasonably under undo all million operations that you just did. So we'll only keep the last, say, five or 10 or 100 operations that you've done. And now, when, if I've got, say, five, a maximum capacity of five, now I do another operation. Well, now it's too full. So what happens? I remove the element out the other end, right? And so that's three operations, insert, remove, but also remove from this end, right? uh, If I have access to all four, then that gives me basically a, a list operation along with a, uh, arbitrary removal insert uh, update, right? Undo features or LRU caches, right? An LRU cache is a least recently used cache, right? That, uh, this, this is especially germane to um, you know, memory management or a memory hierarchy in a computer or hardware uh, where uh, you, you only have so much memory to hold stuff and then you have to you know, write stuff to disk. Uh, so a hit and a miss means that when you're asked for a chunk of memory and it's already loaded into main memory, you just use it. Uh, but if you ask for a chunk of memory and it's not there because it was written to disk, uh, that's called a miss. And so it has to be loaded from the disk. Well, somebody's got to go to make room for it. Who do we kick out? The least recently used one, right? Wh whichever one you haven't asked for for a while. And there's a... And uh, basically a deck, all right? Uh, you, you keep track of that stuff with some sort of data structure like this. Uh, what about in practice? I'm gonna go ahead and separate that variations and in practice. Don't roll your own, right? Don't, uh, you generally do not want to implement your own stack queue, priority queue, Etc. Right. Uh, instead, in Java, the nice solution is a deck parameterized so that you can put whatever you want into it. Let me go about over to my demo here and let's 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 take a look at it. Oops. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. So deck t and I'll just call it foo for now equals what. Let me uh, null for now. This is, bring this in from the utils library, uh, for integers, sorry. It'll hold integers. Uh, and you can't go with a new deck because a deck is just an, uh, an interface. And it'll tell you that such. Uh, cannot instantiate this type deck, why? Well, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's an interface that extends a queue, right? Uh, so what, uh, let's go ahead and pull up the documentation on this now. Java deck. There we go. Ah, kind of small, so let's increase the size there. There we go. It tells you what operations do you want to uh, uh, what operations do you want to support, and what behavior do you want to support. So for example, if you want the first element, in other words, at the head, if you want to insert then you add first or offer first. If you want to remove from the head, you remove first or pull first. If you want to examine, in other words, peak, get first or peak first. Now, what's the difference between these two? 
with an illegal operation, for example, inserting into a full deck uh, means that it would throw an exception. Otherwise, if you want a special value like, you know, no value or false or null or something like that, then you need to call this method over here. Uh, if you want to remove if from an empty deck, then it'll throw an exception if you call first uh, remove first. It'll uh, return a special value, probably null, uh, if you use pull first. The head of this key, uh, deck or null if the deck is empty. Right? So in other words, we've got all of the functionality that we just talked about in one class here, or one interface, I should say. Uh, this is an interface. It doesn't allow you to uh, actually create one. So what are the actual implementing classes? An array deck, what do you think that is? It's an array-based deck. What about a linked list? <laughs> it says what it is, right? It's a linked list implementation. And so if you want a linked list implementation of a stack, a queue, or a deck, then you do something like this in Java. If you want, and so I'll call this my stack. Right? If you want a queue, same thing. Just treat it like a queue. If you want a, uh, I don't know, uh, um, max queue, uh, or, or, sorry, constrained queue, then a new linked list, right? Where this, uh, I think you could put a capacity on this. Capacity. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Linked list. Capacity. Oh, okay. Linked lists don't uh, support a capacity. So let's go ahead and go with an array deck. And let's find how we uh, do a capacity here. Right. Array decks have no capacity restrictions. All right. Fine. Oh, here we go. Construction empty with an initial initial capacity. All right, there's no way to do it. <laughs> I thought there was, but nope. Whatever. So I have no idea what an illegal operation on uh, a full deck would actually entail because uh, according to the documentation here, none of these reach a full capacity. Maybe uh, one of these others do. Concurrent linked queue, I doubt it. And uh, linked blocking queue. Uh, those are thread safe versions of it. So they'll block... Uh, on um, uh, on illegal operations, uh, not illegal operations, but if you ask for something that doesn't exist, it just doesn't throw an exception, it doesn't return null, it says, go to sleep, and I'll wake you up when I have something to give you. That's for uh, multi-threaded environments. Right. There, Q method, add, offer, remove. The equivalent deck method would be add last, offer last, remove first, right? First from the other end. Decks can be LIFO or they can be FIFO. Right. So that's what you use in practice. Don't roll your own. Uh, any questions so far? None? Otherwise, uh, we could just talk about the various applications of these things. Uh, applications. Stack. One application there is, of course, call stacks. Right? Uh, keeping track of, let me go ahead and make this into a sub menu and then call stacks. Keeping track of breadcrumbs in a program. Like if you were, if, if this is uh, especially germane to things like uh, uh, graph algorithms, right? Uh, in particular, DFS, DFS, depth first search, which is something that we'll look at in the context of trees coming up here. Um, you can also simulate recursion. Right? If you use an in-memory stack, then you can simulate the call stack and not have to worry about any stack overflows, not have to worry about function calling, function calling, function. Uh, backtracking algorithms, backtracking slash optimize, uh, optimization uh, algorithms. Back, tra not tracing, but backtracking, right? So backtracking algorithms uh, basically allow you to create an iterative solution 
uh, the, uh, you, you add something to it, uh, to add something to it and you say, okay, this is the, uh, all right, that, that's my capacity. I can't go any further. How good is this solution? Uh, okay, well, it, it, it awards me $100 or something like that. That's what optimization is all about. You have some objective function. It helps to think about those in terms of money, right? So this gives me $100. So now let's backtrack, right? Let's take that solution off, take that solution off, uh, and let's add something different, add something different. Now what do we get? Oh, $120. That's even better. All right, let's, let's keep trying. Take that off, take that off, take that off. Put something on, put something on, put something on. Now what do we get? $90? Okay, that's not as good, right? You're backtracking basically to uh, previous states, basically breadcrumbs again, so that you can find the optimal solution. Uh, another example would be the shunting yard algorithm. And you'll, you'll take a look at that in your lab in a couple of weeks. Uh, anybody have family that work for UP? Uh, that's Union Pacific? No? Yeah, okay, well then do you know what a shunting yard is? Oh, you don't? Okay. Shunting yard? Well, you've got a lot of trains, right? A lot of train cars, 50 cars. Uh, do you take them all uh, do you take them off all individually? No. You back the train if if you want to put a, a, another car in between or you want to break them apart or whatever because this this half is going to uh, Chicago, that half is going to New York, so we need to we need to break it right there. Uh, well, you don't, you don't break it and then this train takes it off and then another train backs in. You pull into the shunting yard. You back into the shunting yard, disconnect, and then this train goes on, right? It's basically a stack. You're shunting it into the stack so that you can pull this out and now it's, it's in the same order as before. Pull out the next 10 cars, pull out the next 10 cars. The, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's what a shunting yard is. That's what shunting is. And you can uh, do the shunting yard algorithm for a lot of applications, especially for uh, uh, like uh, 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 expression evaluation. And that's what you'll be using it for in your lab. Right? That A plus B minus C, right? how do we do that? We use a stack. Uh, or in pre we, can, we can translate that to what's called pre-order traversal uh, and then use a stack to all, uh, really, really efficiently uh, compute that expression. Right? Uh, anybody ever heard of an HP calculator? Okay, it's, it's getting way too old now. It was before my time, so don't don't think that I'm old. Uh, but uh, it's basically a pre-order uh, traversal that where you don't say four plus two, uh, you go four two plus, and then the result gets pushed down into uh, the calculator so that you can continue writing stuff. Uh, and it, it, once you get used to it, it's much faster than regular. Uh, uh, calculators because what do you have to do if you want to go four plus two times three four plus two equals right and then you get a new result uh, and then times three uh, you have to, uh, the order of operations is different and sometimes you have to write things down and then start over in the calculator because the order of op precedence of operations but with a pre-order traversal and an HP calculator there are no issues uh, there are no uh, precedence issues so it's much simpler but you do have to get used to it because you don't say two plus four, you go four, two plus, right? And it's kind of weird, right? Uh, Postfix operation, sorry, not prefix. Uh, queues, of course, are lines, right? Anything where you, uh, things need to be stored in order, queues. Uh, you know, you can have, uh, uh, here, where, where are my applications? Uh, buffers, right? So data comes in, and it needs to be processed in the order that it came in. So where do you store it temporarily? Well, you're waiting for more data to come in because you want to process a large chunk, or uh, uh, more data is coming in, more data is coming in, and you can only process so much at a time, right? You need a place to store that for, so that you don't lose data. But you also want to maintain that, uh, that order. So a buffer, a queue is a perfect data structure to do that with. Uh, server requests. All right, requests or a consumer producer um, scenario. So consumer producer scenario is where you've got a lot of independent requests. Those requests come in and they get served in the order that they're received so that it's fair, right? Or resource pools. Think about your... Uh, uh, 
making connections to using JDBC right now. Uh, one uh, the, making a connection is actually quite expensive because you have that initial handshake. So one solution to that is to create 100 connections up front and then reuse those connections. Don't close them. You need to put them into a pool. Well, how does the pool manage those resources? Uh, you, you can use a queue, right? Put all those connections into the queue. When somebody asks for a connection, you take the next one out and give it to them, right? Uh, and then when somebody is done with that connection, you take it and put it back at the other end of the, of the queue. Why not just work at one end? The same connection is getting used over and over and over and over again, right? And you're just putting it back and you're making one of those things, whatever it is, do all the work and the other people are just sitting in the back not doing anything, right? Uh, but by making, making it into a queue, uh, then everybody goes through the queue at least once before anybody else has gone through. And, every, and you're basically distributing the work among different independent resources. If those are connections, uh, not that big of a deal. But think about if those are uh, like a hundred server farm. You've got a hundred servers. You don't want that one server doing all the work. You want to distribute it to all the servers. Right? Lots of other applications to all this stuff. So, uh, what we'll do on Monday, or sorry, not Monday, uh, Tuesday, is we'll go on and we'll, we'll wrap back around and use this as a motivator for introducing algorithms and algorithm analysis in a formal manner. Because as we've already seen, that painter paradox, it makes a huge difference, even with something simple like a list-based data structure. Right? Make sure to take your paint can with you. No questions online? Have a good weekend.